Welcome to In the Lab with Hoopsology. I am your host, Matt Thomas, joined by my best friend and co-host, Justin Goodrum. Justin, how you doing, man? Doing pretty good. How about yourself? Doing well. You know, gearing up with all this all-star news and some stuff that we discussed last week, some stuff we've been talking about with guests that'll be coming soon. Uh, So getting excited for that, kind of wondering... What's going to become of the All-Star Game? We're going to talk about a little bit of that today. We have several big topics. Things are are busy as always here with youth basketball and otherwise going on this spring. How about you, man? How are you doing? Uh, pretty well. I mean, this is one of my favorite times of the year. You got the Super Bowl, All-Star Weekend. There's usually like a UFC fight. You know, NHL has had their All-Star Game. So it's a pretty good like um, sports month. And then it kind of, well, I, I take that back. A couple of weeks, it gets a little bit slow, but then got March Madness. So pretty much if you're a sports fan, I mean, you're pretty much set till May. So, And we got WrestleMania coming soon too, right? Oh, so Don't get me started. All kinds of stuff on that. I know. Yeah. I know you got thoughts on that. We'll save that. I don't know. Another podcast, another day another or something. Time. Yeah. <laughs> we'll see how things unfold. Maybe, maybe follow up with you on that. Yeah. But yes, I'm with you. Um We definitely have a lot to cover today. We have two major injuries that we got word of this week, so we'll review some of that. We got All-Star Reserves announced, and we also have trade deadline coming uh, tomorrow, February 8th, at the time of this recording, so we'll touch on that a little bit as well. Justin, we'll go ahead and lead in. Uh, actually, excuse me, before we get to that, just a quick reminder and a thank you for supporting the show. Be sure you share, like, and subscribe to our content, whether you're doing the podcast thing or the video thing over on the YouTube side. We really appreciate all the support as always. We have an interview that we recorded just yesterday that I am super excited for you all to hear about. That That's going to be dropping really soon. And now, without further ado, let's go ahead and lead into our topics here, Justin. And, you know, there's there's no easy way to bring this up, to discuss it. He's been having such a great season. It's unfortunate. It it was a little bit of unlucky timing for our podcast because we kind of discussed Embiid and the weirdness of getting an announcement. He wasn't going to be playing in Denver against Jokic 15 minutes before tip-off. And then we get... During, I I think just immediately after the recording of our podcast, Embiid gets fallen on basically on top of his knee by Jonathan Kaminga of the Warriors in that game. And now we have Joel Embiid likely out for an extended amount of time. Certainly seems like he will miss that 65 game cutoff in any time, uh, any consideration for postseason awards in which as we mentioned, he's the front runner for that MVP to this point. But now it's it's going to be a big question, I think, in terms of the Sixers championship viability. Before we give our thoughts, I'll go ahead and throw it to Shaquille O'Neal on Inside the NBA. Here's a few words from Shaq on this. I love the way he was playing. He's been in the groove all year. Uh, hopefully it's not as bad as what has been reported. Uh, but I mean, I, I mean, I feel for the kid. You know, I, I, I've been watching him play closely all year. You know, the seventy-point game was phenomenal. But the way he's playing, the way he's dominant, the way he's taking over the game, like he just had it. And like I haven't seen a guy play like that in a long time. And, you know, from start to now, he's just been playing uh, the clear-cut MVP. I know he's close to like if he missed a couple more games, he'd be uh, uh, ineligible. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, for that, but listen, the way this guy was playing. Kim Olajuwon, like, you know, just dominating smooth. You know, his his uh, free throw line jumper was automatic. You know, three-point ball was automatic. And, you know, hopefully it's not that bad. But if it is, I, I might have to agree with Chuck, I think. And especially when you have to sit out for a long period of time and then try to come back and play at that same same level. You know, it's going to be difficult. But I feel for the kid because he was, he was a clear-cut MVP for this year. I think everyone – agrees with Shaq as as far as that point goes you know you just feel for Joel Embiid um you know there there's a lot of different discourse about this i think everyone agrees it's it's a bummer when an mvp candidate is 
knocked out of that race for one thing, but I think more importantly to Embiid, since he's already picked up an MVP, those title hopes, and you wonder how that's going. We've heard a lot of different things, Justin, as far as like Embiid not being able to jump uh, even before that Denver tip-off. So he really was, I think, just trying to carry the Sixers and um, just stay active as long as he could. I I think he really does care about that MVP award, and I don't fault him for that. I appreciate the effort, certainly on his part. But Justin, I've been blabbing here. What are your initial thoughts on just this Embiid situation? Yeah, it's unfortunate. Um, I'm not surprised from Shaq's comments, just considering, you know, Shaq does love the big men that dominate, and, you know, they're – main work is in the post and not taking three. So I'm not surprised by his response to Embiid. I think this is a concern for the rest of Embiid's career, isn't it? In terms of his long-term health. I think so. And and him just being reliable season after season. I mean, we're not talking about this regarding Giannis. And so, I mean, he's a similar player. I I realize they do different things, but similar height. Um, And this is a, a concern in terms of, what do you do with this guy? I mean, he's he clearly he is the MVP front runner, like you and Shaq said, Matt. And with his, with losing him, I think it's a point moving forward for the rest of his career, whether it's in Philly or if he moves on to another team. Um, do you play this guy the maximum amount of games as possible, or do you kind of just finagle him through the rest of the season, baby him within the rules of the NBA to get him to the playoffs? I mean. That's, I think that's the main – the game is to win the championship, not to win MVP, is it? I mean, if you can win MVP, that's a nice bonus. But ultimately, I think he wants the championship. And him just maximizing his output, I think we've seen where it has some disastrous consequences as we've seen with this injury. Right. And Justin, if I can cut you off for a second, just to add context to that, totally agree. And I think when we've had this meniscus injuries in the past, I'm no physical therapist, but I know a little bit in the movement realm. When you have this meniscus injury, there's two options. And I'm sure many basketball fans remember Dwayne Wade's situation. You can either remove the meniscus or you can repair the meniscus. You usually get better long-term results, like less frequent pain and and more use of it. If you are patient with the repair, you can come back from the injury sooner and recover from the injury sooner if you remove the meniscus. But the meniscus is kind of the shock absorber of the knee. And so you get the chance, uh, some things that Dwayne Wade dealt with because he had the meniscus removed. You get the chance for more pain sooner Uh, If you remove the meniscus, and I saw this and thought it was interesting from friend of the show, Jeff Stotts. He's at In Street Clothes on Twitter. And if you're not following Jeff, you need to be. He's got great insight on injuries. We referred to him a lot on the show uh, because of his inside knowledge. And he says, regarding Embiid, as the vagueness on specifics continues, the hope for a late season return suggests Embiid underwent a meniscectomy, which would be yeah. removal of the meniscus. Um, so interesting to hear that. So you wonder if Embiid is thinking, you know, this is my shot for the title this year and kind of making a rush to get back. Of course, none of that confirmed. This is speculation, just kind of an educated guess on Jeff Stott's part. But I find that interesting. And I think it should be said too, that Embiid may have already outplayed expectations. Remember he was drafted third because specifically of injury concerns, not because of talent concerns when he was drafted, I believe in 2014. So for him to win an MVP, for him to do many of the things that he's done, of course, every great player wants to win a title, no doubt, but Embiid's had a great career to this point. You would imagine he's going to be able to play more, but I think it's fair, Justin, as you mentioned, to question what level he's going to be able to play at given that injury history. And do you feel like with regards to the Sixers, you know, moving to the franchise side of things, 
Do you feel, I mean, we've got Boston, who's a great team. We've got Milwaukee, who has things to figure out, but you assume they're going to be in the hunt for things. Do you feel like this was like one of those window years for the 76ers with how Embiid is performing? We saw how they did in the postseason last year. I mean, what do you feel their title chances were, you know, before this injury happened? And do you feel like it's wise for Embiid to come back quickly if he is? Um. I think if we see in this new age of the NBA, I don't think we see like your super duper power teams. I think mean, they're good teams, but I wouldn't consider like a power team. Like I guess I could see the Bucks and Celtics losing in a year. Mm-hmm. And the other teams that are in the top six, take a look at the Pacers, Heat, you know, you got the Cavaliers. I mean, the Knicks are all pretty interchangeable. Mm-hmm. I think it's one of those things we've seen where the NBA is a lot more competitive. I mean, you take a look at my point earlier about baby and beat. It's like, can to can to knock my own point? I mean, that's where you run into a little bit of a situation. It's kind of like, are they can they afford to baby him because they're fifth now? But you know, the Pacers and Heat are right behind them. So if he does come back, when he comes back before the playoffs start, like they're not going to be able just to play a minimum minutes, like. They could play, they could drop to the bottom of the conference if they're not careful. I mean, it's so close. I mean, mm-hmm. the Cavaliers are second, and weren't we talking about them having like kind of a disappointing season earlier? I mean, they're the second seed now. I mean, who knows what's gonna what's gonna happen? So, I think overall with the 76ers, I think it's a situation where you just you put all the chips with them and you let it ride. I mean, at this point, you you grew with him, and I think you're just gonna have to let it go in terms of. And being a franchise, and with Tyrese Maxey too, I mean that's when he's going to have to step up in this situation. But we've seen with the stats so far. I mean they're twenty six and eight with Embiid in the lineup, so clearly he is a difference maker. I wouldn't call them a lottery team. I think that's what Barkley called them, or so somebody called it, the Sixers are a lottery team without Embiid. I mean that wouldn't go. That's I think that's kind of mm. ridiculous. But mm. I do think in terms of being a title contender, Embiid is that guy that makes him that way. Yeah, I, I think given Embiid's history, I would take my time here. I mean, I, I tend to be of the view in general where if a player's healthy, I don't like load management. Like, are you healthy or not? Um, you know, but if a player, especially with Embiid's history, I mean, I, I don't know who's advising him and what they're advising him, but it seems like it would be wiser to go for the repair, you know, and, and hopefully have better long-term outcomes. Um, I'm sure he's got a smart team of people around him and and he's making that decision. I, I just think if they do drop, you know, to six, seven, or eight, how far are you really going to run in the postseason this year, even if you get Embiid back at 80%? Like, I, is it going to be a good thing to to drop in the second round? I mean, I, I would applaud the effort and trying, certainly, uh, and appreciate that. but we're at the point with this Sixers team, especially in the Embiid era, where you should be, I mean, really, if you're not confident, like 80% greater confidence that you're going to make the Eastern Conference Finals, I don't know, in this situation, I, I kind of would be patient. But, you know, that's that's what's so frustrating about a big injury rap sheet like this is we may be in the same situation next year with Embiid. I mean, you know, God well. forbid, I, I hope not. But you just never know. There were checkered years there for Embiid for a while there. Um, and And we've had actually kind of a rare stretch of health for him over the past two years, like up until this point, you know? Yeah, so I, I feel for the guy. It's, it's too yeah, bad. Me too. It's tough. Luckily. I mean, it's not, it's not like he's out for the season. So I think it's doing right. I mean, MVP's out, but I don't think like the season now you have the all-star break. I mean, there is, I mean, it's a perfect time kind of for him to get hurt in the way with the timing, the way it works out. Um, he gets a lot more rest than usual. So. Yep. Absolutely. I was also seeing, you know, just one last thing and then we'll move on. I was also seeing a lot of chatter about like Draymond Green talked about it in his podcast, just kind of complaining about the 65 game rule and this is unfair. Other players didn't have to do this. Um, I don't believe we've seen an MVP 
be awarded to a player who's played less than 65 games anyway. So I feel like some of this conversation, you know, I think, I think people are emoting and feeling sympathy for Embiid. And I understand that, but I don't think that changes any of positions that we've stated on this show, as far as how I feel about that 65 game rule, you know, it's, it's a bad roll of the dice. Like we, we just said, we feel for Embiid, but I don't see any need to change or, or move that rule around. And I also think I respect Embiid as an adult who has autonomy that if he wanted to push to play games, I respect that decision. And I, it's just unfortunate the way it played out. I don't okay. fault media pressure or things of that like for this injury happening. I, I think it's just an unfortunate situation. Well, it was a very privileged take to have in my opinion when the nba has the most powerful players union and they're just complaining mm, about this in terms of draymond's take and, yeah in terms of draymond's gotcha. take yeah i just i don't know i just find that a little bit privilege on his part but we can that's for another time <laughs> you're right no and if, if that's a great point i mean it is a very strong players union um but yes, we got to move on. We got some extra topics here too that we got to cover. Quick review for you guys because the All-Star Reserves have been announced. I'm sure you've seen it to this point. Uh, but just to list them off for you real quick in the Western Conference, we have a couple Clippers and a couple Timberwolves. We got Kawhi Leonard, uh, Anthony Edwards, Paul George, Carl Anthony Towns. And then we also have Anthony Davis, Devin Booker, Stephen Curry, and that rounds out our Western Conference reserves. You know, notable snubs, allegedly, maybe you agree, maybe not, Justin. We can mention it real quick, but I think DeMontis Sabonis was mentioned as, as a snub. I think there is some merit to that, in my opinion, just with where the Kings are placed. And many of the guys in this reserve role are second fiddles on their team, or maybe even less, you could argue uh, in the case of like Paul George, let's say, although many would say he's the number two on the Clippers there. Um, any thoughts on those reserves or any any glaring omissions from what you've seen? Another that was mentioned and the teammates talked to each other was Rudy Gobert, but you do have two that. Timberwolves in there. Yeah, I'm not really outraged, but I think some maybe omissions to discuss with De'Aaron Fox. I mean, he's averaging mm. 27 points a game. Dang. I mean, that's something not to, to sneeze at. And then, then Victor Wimbenyama. I mean, I I think mm. that's a bit of a surprise, especially from a fan vote's perspective. Like, mm. I just thought that would have maybe carried him to the reserves just because he's so popular. He's just, I feel like his, the Spurs are just super terrible. People we just forgot about him, unfortunately. Mm. So I think that might have hurt him as well. But I'm not super outraged about snubs. I don't know. Yeah, Curry has been playing pretty ridiculously. Um, it, it's just the Warriors, you know, being so low. But you know, Curry does super well with with the fans and the yeah. like. And he's such Quite a big faces name. In the league. So. He's kind of like yeah. sort of a, a legacy. <laughs> yeah, guy. he's like Kobe um, when the Lakers were terrible. So I mean. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, and, and yeah, Kobe certainly <laughs> deserved to be there too. Sure. Um, so I think it's, it's difficult to kind of bump some of these names out like Anthony Davis too. I give him credit. He's been there. He's been putting up numbers. We talked about it when the starters were announced that I thought he's more deserving to be a starter than LeBron this year, in, in yeah. my opinion. Um, but it's, it's difficult because then you have like Sabonis, the office, Offense flows through him and Deer and Fox on that same team. I mean, those guys, you can kind of argue who's the number one and who's the number two on that team. And they're having more success, you know, than, than like a Warriors and a Lakers. Um, you've got two Clippers and two Timberwolves. Like, do you like to see more team representation or not? These are all takes that are, there's perfectly good arguments on both sides, really. I know that sounds like such a cop-out, but it, it kind of depends on your preference. The other thing too, you know, the Rockets with their, and I'm biased as a fan, but with their recovery of the most wins compared to last season already, and Shangun being the offense for that team. I mean, basically, it's 
similar to the Kings. You know, it's Fred Van Vliet and uh, Shangun that dictate that offense. You know, it would be kind of cool to see Shangun make it. He's also had the baby Jokic comparisons and has been putting up stats, but I get it. I mean, the Rockets are hovering above and just below 500, depending on the time of the season. So I- I'm with you, long story short, that I don't feel a ton of outrage on this list. We'll go ahead and jump into the Eastern Conference list to update on that. Jalen Brown, Donovan Mitchell, Jalen Brunson, who we mentioned earlier, probably should have been a starter. Bam Adebayo, Julius Randle, Tyrese Maxey, and Paolo Banquero. Uh, Paolo Banquero, this is his first time. Tyrese Maxey, this is his first time as well. So congratulations to them. Again, another deep list here in in this conference anything come to mind now i i need to mention also with this news that um trey young was mentioned as like kind of one of the the snubs uh one of the top snubs um they have replaced uh joel Embiid now with this injury news um as well as Julius Randle with his injury news with Scotty Barnes and Trey Young. So those guys are in as all-star reserves. Uh, So congratulations to them as well. I feel like, just to give you my thoughts right off the bat, I feel like that's kind of appropriate for Trey Young. He does put up lots of numbers, but the team has been pretty bad this year and underperforming. So he's got the numbers to be an all-star, but I think it's appropriate to get in this way in a sense. Any thoughts about that Eastern Conference list or if there's been any snubs there, Justin? Um, I don't think so. I mean, I feel pretty good about the list. I mean, uh, none of the Bulls, I think, deserve it. Um, Hmm. I think DeMar DeRozan is pretty consistent, but I don't know if he – get really replacing with these guys. I feel pretty good about it. And also guys get hurt and guys get in. So it's just like to be offended for a guy. I I think like you were saying on our last week's episode, all NBA, I just think means way more to basketball heads than the all-star team. Yeah. Agreed. And shout out to the bulls. Great game against the Timberwolves last night. I don't know if you caught that, but it was, that was a very fun watch down to the wire. Um, So DeMar DeRozan, maybe if that game had hit a little bit earlier, he would have had a shot. Right. Wanted to get your quick thoughts, Justin. I, I'm a pretty big like purist and traditionalist, maybe to a detriment. I personally like the league going back into like this East versus West um, all-star game format. What are your thoughts on that? Do you think it's going to help the game in any sense uh, returning to an East versus West format? Uh, I don't think so. Personally, I like the guys picking teams. I just mm. thought that was cool. I just thought the psychological warfare, this like, you know, LeBron picking somebody that Kevin Durant wanted and Durant getting upset or vice versa. I like that personally. I like just seeing, you know, guys that are teammates have to go against each other. So like East versus West, I, mean, I think it's kind of boring. I will say the jerseys, nice job on the jerseys. I don't know if you've seen the jerseys not for mm-hmm. the game, but I think Good job on those. But um, to your point, Matt, I I don't know. I'm, I think it's kind of boring, to be honest. Um, I, I like the guys picking teams, in my opinion. I just think that would have been cool to see. I've, I kind of feel like now the All-Star game, the way it's going, and maybe this will lead into our next question, but it seems like to keep it successful and interesting, it just has to cycle every couple of years. Like I think the picking teams did nothing for the all-star game last year. Like that was, that was a rough watch last year. And part of it was that, you know, people were complaining about being in Utah. Um, we've, we've heard a lot of negativity around the all-star game. I mean, the past couple of years, but I think maybe the pick em strategy just got kind of stale and we need to wait until maybe it's different faces of the league doing the picking for that to be effective again. Sure. I don't know. I mean, this is all, you know, just hypothetical theories. Um, but I, the other thing I wanted to mention, you know, with keeping in mind that game in Utah last year and kind of how rough that was following up with that, you know, the NFL has gotten rid of the pro bowl game itself. They still have the honor. They still have like 
the skills competitions and things like that, kind of a fun weekend around it. Do you think the ultimate destiny of the NBA all-star game is to kind of go that way too? Or do you think, are you more hopeful that it can kind of have new life? Well, the big difference is that the NFL plays a way more violent game. So Mm. pro bowl, I mean, by making it flag football, it's way safer. And you keep most of the entertainment value and the guys get to have fun compared to the pro bowl in which guys get hurt. Um, I don't know. I, it's really tough in these all-star game scenarios. Yeah. I think, and I don't know, maybe I'm just to your point about being old school. When watching the game, I, the all-star game, I really appreciate it. Kind of like it's being a celebration of the game of basketball and seeing the legends. I think I miss that in terms of, you know, I, I had to pull out, you know, when I was, you know, the whole, like when back in my day, but, you know, back <laughs> in the 90s, you know, NBC had a lot of stuff for kids. I mean, I don't know if you remember they had the, um, I don't know what you would call it, but they had like a big celebration of what all the mascots would come out and it would be like kind of an all-star celebration just for kids. It was kind of in, in league with the um, inside stuff on NBC. They do kind of a big thing before all-star weekend took place. And they have all these events as well. And I don't know. I think TNT's actually done a pretty good job. I think honestly, if they lose the rights to the NBA, um, I think the All-Star game is going to take a further hit because, honestly, they mm. saved weekend in terms of just their shenanigans and just, like, honestly, they made the weekend more entertaining, just whatever it, stuff that they do um, compared to what happens on a normal um, All-Star Saturday night. I don't. I like the game. I don't know. I think putting a lot more money on the line, and to me, not even in the players' pockets, when I put, like, $20 million on the line for, like, charity, I mean, I think that would be cool. Like, just put a big pot of money, the players. I don't know. Just do something to really get them motivated. I don't know. I, It's tough. I know we have some illusions in terms of making the um, All-Star Saturday Night better, in particular the dunk contest. Um, I think there's some cool ideas out there in terms of social media. Like, I think um, Jordan Kilgannon had a great idea. You know, you take the best dunkers in each – NBA town, you have people vote on social media. You have a tournament in terms of which person has the best dunk. And then, you know, the top three dunkers on social media versus the top NBA dunkers, bam, right there. There's always, and then you have, it makes the NBA dunkers that you don't know more relevant because you don't want, they don't want them to lose to these internet dunkers. I think there's different things you can do. Yeah. To make it fresh. Okay. So. Yeah, we do have a guest that's going to be talking about some ideas around this. So I don't, yeah. I don't want to step on this too much, but um, I do feel like the All Star Game itself, just with the attitude around it, I feel more like the All Star Game, not All Star Weekend, but the game is a little bit on life support, and they're kind of trying to see if they can keep this going or not. But I'm very curious to see how it turns out this year, um, and. And we'll be looking to that big time. I think you're right on the money with TNT and like the infrastructure around the coverage and things like that. It's always felt like more of a spectacle weekend to me than Pro Bowl weekend has for the NFL. Like just just more fun to tune in overall for like that Saturday night, all the skills competitions and all that stuff. Um We'll be curious to see how that goes. I certainly still want it to stick around um, as long as the all-star game itself isn't kind of this, you know, like like back out of the hoop, out of the way type of thing, like to that extent. Um, no. If ESPN gets the rights to that weekend, it'll kill all-star weekend. And I, I want to give from a coverage standpoint. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm with you there and I want to give a shout out too since you mentioned the dunk contest recent news that just came out that Jalen Brown is thinking about doing I the dunk contest which is awesome. That's a pretty big name star. I I would say probably the biggest name since maybe like the Aaron Gordon, Zach Levine. Uh, and he's certainly been a more impactful player uh, and like higher on the the actual like you know, kind of superstar uh, rankings. I think you would, anyone would agree. I mean, he's a max contract guy, one of the highest paid players in the league. So for him to come and put his reputation on the line with that, I think is pretty cool. So shout out to him. And I hope, I hope he follows through with it and, and helps put a little more excitement in this dunk contest. Uh, Cause I think the bigger name will help Justin. I know we're running short on time here. Yeah. 
got a couple more things I want to cover with you. Um, we do unfortunately have some more injury news and I thought we should cover it since we've been covering the trade chatter on it, uh, for your bulls, Justin, <laughs> sorry to, to bring it up sometimes nah, when it rains, it pours a little <laughs> bit, but maybe this is good in some ways for playtime and, and development, you know, certainly not good anytime an injury happens, but Zach Levine, this is per Shams Sharania. Uh, Zach Levine is expected to have surgery during the upcoming week and miss a total of four to six months. And this was reported on February 3rd. Um, and this came down after a consultation with Clutch Sports Group that Shams also added to that information share. So you have people, you know, of course, joking like he's going to get traded to the Pistons. So he decided, <laughs> oh, I'm going to stay injured and, and unable to be traded. I don't know about all that. But, Justin, I just want your thoughts, you know, as a Bulls fan, what's going on with Zach Levine and – um how how are you feeling about this? I think he can opt into another year yeah. on his deal next season. Yeah, I think this kind of ties into our next point too, if you don't mind, Matt, in terms sure. of like the two teams that, that make a trade. And I want to tie this in with Zach Levine because I do think the Bulls actually need to do something. But I, I um, unfortunately, I don't think they're going to. Just with the rumors about how what they want for Alice Caruso, like I just... I think their expectations are fairly unrealistic. Um, mm -hmm. I think the player to move would be Andre Drummond. And to that point, with Zach Levine getting her, I, I did, we've talked about, I feel like I'm just repeating myself every week we get on here. We ask me about the Bulls. They're ninth right now in the East. They're not going to win the championship. They're not even going to get to the fifth seed. Mm. They're not better than, I would say, really any teams that are above them. They're better than the teams that are behind them. They're not the worst teams in the East. But at this point, I just – it's just a waste of time. We're just wasting time with this team, unfortunately. And I do think they have some good young building blocks. Like I think Kobe White, you take a look, he's really coming to his own this season. He's averaging 19.4 points, around five assists, close to five rebounds, all career best. He's shooting 46% from the field. I mean, he's really performing well under this new responsibility. but. At this point, with all these stars, it's clear without Lonzo Ball, he was the missing piece to all this since he gotten hurt that this team does not work without him. I think that's mm -hmm. abundantly clear. And I think with Zach Levine getting hurt, even though I think we've seen the Bulls somewhat play better without him, they're not that much better without him. They're not, it's not like they went on a 20-game winning streak here. So I think overall with all these guys, whether Levine's hurt, whether he's not, where he's opted, I, I think with these first front office, they really think like with everybody healthy, they can really make a run. And I just think even with Lonzo Ball, I think they're like the fourth best team in the East. Not even in the mm -hmm. NBA, we're talking about the East. Yeah, Europe. and and who knows yeah. how he's going to come back. Let, let me just clarify, Justin, because I want to understand your point fully. Yeah. Um, when you're saying like all these guys, are you are you meaning like? Let's keep our young core intact, like Kobe White and Patrick Williams, like the younger guys that we talked with Julia Poe about. Or are you saying like anyone's on the table? Let's get let's get a deal done. I would like to keep the younger guys if possible, but honestly, I was just the just the full clean house option. I think is wise in this in this decision here. For I like think. young talent or draft picks. Thought draft either, picks either way. I think Seeing what um, Oklahoma City has done, seeing what other franchises have done in terms of stocking picks, I think is the wisest decision here. Building through the draft and just having some years where it's lean out or some risk. I mean, take a look at the Pistons. They're horrible. And they, they, they tried that strategy. So it can certainly backfire. But at this point, trying to build your team with this mediocre free agents, it kind of reminds me of like the Knicks of old. Mm. Like it's a Knicks move mm. to do this. So, And I think we've seen it where it's just not successful at this point. Gotcha. Yeah, I think the Bulls are a great pick. By the way, we're going through, if you couldn't tell, teams we think need to make a trade at this deadline uh, that would benefit the most. For me, it's not any any title contenders, anyone in reach of that as well. I don't think there's a deal out there that really pushes someone over the edge, at least not something that's predictable and, and wouldn't be completely just out of left field. You know, It doesn't seem like anyone's willing to get rid of their stars and things like that. 
So I'll give you one and, and then I'll throw back to you for another sure. pick, Justin. Uh, I'm going to go with my team as well. And I think there's been a big debate in the fan base and in the media coverage for the Rockets. Um, and I know it's not a popular take. There's been rumors circulating for a little while about Jalen Green being traded for Mikhail Bridges. And obviously you would need to include some of the Brooklyn Nets draft picks, things along those lines. It is very crowded in Houston right now. And I don't think we have enough proof to this point that Jalen Green is going to be worth holding on to. Like I, I'm wavering in confidence that he's going to be like an all-star level player. I'm not saying that there's no chance he can do it, but it seems right now he's like a volume scorer that that they don't really need in Houston uh, with the infrastructure and, and the luck, frankly, that they've had with some of their draft picks. Um, I mean, with like uh, Cam Whitmore, I believe, um, it looks like he's ready to step in in a backcourt role. If you could leverage Jalen Green for Mikhail Bridges at this point, who I think would line up nicely with Coach Udoka and, and his system and what he wants for defense, I would do that uh, in a heartbeat for my from my own perspective here. A lot of Rockets fans I know would disagree with that and are kind of waiting and hoping on Jalen Green. I don't have any problem with Jalen Green. I don't dislike Jalen Green. Obviously, I root for him, but mm -hmm. I would make this deal now. So that's mm. my first pick. Uh, Justin, you had the Bulls that you outlined well. Is there another team that you had in mind that you think could benefit from a deal? Yeah, I would say tight end to the Bulls as a 76ers uh, with him being mm. going out. I mean, Andre Drummond, he played there. I need a big guy. I mean, mm. that I interesting. So I think that's not a bad idea for them. And also they're trying to make, you know, a move in terms of winning the championship. So um, I think that might be under interest. But like I'm saying, I don't really see any any like massive guys on the tr on the trade market before we go i want to ask you kind of to this point clay thompson's name has been brought up yeah and he's been i think he was benched on the previous i think the previous game i think and right in the fourth quarter in the fourth uh, quarter i think he was against the nets i want to say um yeah he just seemed very kind of dejected in the locker room. Wouldn't listen to Steph Curry when he was yeah. talking to him, like kick the chair on the yeah. sidelines. I mean, I, I feel for Clay. That's that's rough to see your career sort of coming down to a lower level than you're used to playing at. Well, they brought it up with, you know, Candace said specifically, like your mind says that you can be dominant, but your yeah. body is not really replicating that on the court. So I'm just wondering, did this Golden State, do they see an opportunity to do something drastic or do there's loyalty there? I mean, what, what does happen? Um, yeah, I know it's been kind of brought up. So I just wanted to run that idea past you. Yeah. I, if I would say we're probably past the time, like they probably now in hindsight being 2020, but they probably waited too long in golden state. It looks like, mm. um, and and they're in a rough spot right now. Uh, it's yeah. where they may have to consider moving off of younger assets to be able to move some of the older assets and move off of some of the salary that they have committed. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's it's going to be rough. Uh, you know, rumors to Clay going to Philadelphia, who you mentioned. Rumors of Clay going to Milwaukee. I hard to see that happening, or even L.A. We know his his father's connection with the team in the past. Um, but tough to imagine any of that going down in a deal that makes sense. One more to throw at you, and I don't have much analysis on this, so to be quick, but I think also the Atlanta Hawks. I know DeJounte Murray is in trade rumors all over the place. Honestly, with this team, they've underwhelmed so much. Um, I, I was betting on Coach Quinn Snyder to build them up a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Just doesn't seem like they have a whole lot that will be successful moving forward. So I think everyone's on the table or should be in Atlanta, including Trey Young. That makes sense. Yeah, they're another team. That, I mean, that's, that's a really good team to bring up. They, they remind me a lot of Chicago. I mean... Mm. And I honestly did have more success than the Bulls, but he really go this further with Trey Young and with this team? I don't think so. And we've so, had the last two years with them, yeah. and I I just don't 
see a higher ceiling that Trey yeah. can reach at this point. I mean, he's got great statistics. Not by himself. Um, no. But yeah, exactly. And and I don't think, as we've talked about before, I don't think he's a 1A. So they need to figure things out with that. And it may just be a change of scenery. Justin, always a pleasure doing these episodes with you. We got through a lot today in a fairly quick amount of time. Um, Thank you, listeners, if you made it this far. Appreciate the support. Let us know your thoughts on all this. I mean, what would you do if you are the front office in Philadelphia, in Chicago at this point? What are your thoughts on East versus West in the All-Star game? Do you think there can be a revival of the All-Star game, or do you think it's it's kind of on life support, like I said earlier? Maybe that's a crazy take. Um, and then also... Who do you think needs to make a trade and what would you like to see? Um, Let us know in the comments. We always enjoy reading the feedback. We got to get out of here and get into actually another exciting interview. So for Justin Goodrum, I'm Matt Thomas. Take care and peace out. See you next time.